Amen. Our text this morning is Mark chapter 12, beginning in verse 28. Mark chapter 12, verse 28. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? And Jesus answered, the most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. And as Jesus taught in the temple, he said, how can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself, in the Holy Spirit, declared, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. So how is he his son? And the great throng heard him gladly. Let us pray together. Righteous Father, Grant that we may understand this word that you have preserved from the Holy Gospel. The teaching of your son, the question and the reaction of the scribe. Righteous Father, we pray that we apply these things to our hearts and to our deeds, that we live faithfully and righteously before you. And we thank you, Father, for the redemption that we find in your son. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. So the past few weeks, we have seen the chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all challenging Jesus with questions. All right, they've been challenging Jesus' authority. Uh, they have, they've been disingenuous. Right? They come to him seeming like they're asking about one thing when really they have ulterior motives. They've got something else going on. Uh, they have tended to focus on pretty worldly things over the course of this questioning. And all of them, in one way or another, have denied God the things that belong to God. Right? That's one of the central teachings of this whole section. Whenever the Pharisees ask Jesus if it's, whether they should uh, pay taxes to Caesar, Jesus says, You render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, render to God the things that are God's. Right? Consistent with what he said in the cleansing of the temple. Right? God said, This is my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Right? They have taken something that ought to belong to God, something that rightly does belong to God, and they've tried to take it away from him and turn it to their own purposes. Jesus has called that out again and again over these uh, past several episodes of them coming and questioning him. Today's text is refreshingly different. It's another question, but the scribe who questions Jesus in today's gospel is different from the others in pretty much every way. But let's begin with his motive. Why does this guy come up to Jesus and ask him this question? All right, it, it, we can, let's consider by way of contrast, by the way, the motives of all of these other people that have questioned him. The chief priests and the scribes have questioned Jesus uh, because they are upset at his cleansing of the temple. Right? He has overturned the money changers' tables. It's going to cost the chief priests and the scribes something he has upset the balance of things. 
They don't like it. And so they challenge his authority on it. That's their motive. The Pharisees, whenever they ask Jesus this question about taxes, their motive, they don't care about taxes. What they're trying to do is ensnare him. That's their motive. The Sadducees ask Jesus this question about the resurrection. Is the resurrection their motive? Do they want to understand anything about the resurrection? They don't even believe in the resurrection. They have other motives. All of these guys have false motives in approaching Jesus with their questions. What does Mark tell us about this man's motive? He heard these disputes and he saw that Jesus answered all things well. The scribe asks his question because he's been listening. Now, we will see towards the end that it falls a little short of true biblical listening. I'll, I'll explain that in just a minute. But he is listening in a, in a genuine way. So that's his motive. He hears the Lord speaking. He sees that the Lord has answered them well, and so he brings his question. Next, we should notice just what kind of question the scribe asks to Jesus. Consider what the others have asked. Right? The Pharisees have been focused on worldly matters. Right? Even though, again, we know their question's not sincere, but even the false face that they are trying to put on in front of Jesus is a worldly mask. Should we pay our taxes? The worldly concern. The Sadducees, likewise, have a worldly concern. Again, they don't, they don't believe in the resurrection, and we saw that they make worldly assumptions about you know, if the resurrection were real, it would have to work basically the same way that the world works today. So they want to know, you know, uh, whose wife is this woman going to be? Right, they come with worldly assumptions, worldly questions, but what is this man's question, the scribe that comes to Jesus? He asks, which commandment is the most important of all? He has a question about the scripture. None of the rest of these guys have had a question about scripture. He has a question about the scripture. Which commandment? Right? Take me to the scriptures, Jesus. And point out to me which one of the commandments in the Torah is most important of all. So it's not just about Scripture, it's also about godly living. Which one is most important? It's the, it's probably, it's the first good question that we have seen in weeks. And Jesus, you'll notice, gives him a straight answer to that question. All right, and all of these other questions... Jesus has had to do a lot of straightening out and calling out false motives before he even then begins to answer the question. Here, he gives the man a straight answer and in fact gives him two answers. Right? He gets a two for one on this. He only asked for the most important commandment. Jesus gives him the two most important commandments. Finally, we should look at the scribe's response to Jesus' answer. Right? So Jesus gives him this straight answer. The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. Now look at the scribe's response. How does he receive this answer? Right, the rest of these guys that we've talked about, they're angry, they're frustrated, they're disappointed, they go away wanting to kill Jesus. The scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. All right, how is that for an answer? Those first three words in particular, you are right, that is 
And basically, you look at the way that he responds. He's basically just repeating back everything that Jesus has just said. He reaffirms what Jesus says. Right? That's, a, that's a model response. The Lord tells us something, and we start out with, you're right. And then we just literally spit right back exactly what the Lord says. All right, in all of these regards, the scribe is a model for us. Right, because anyone can come to the word of the Lord to ask questions. People do it all the time. Right, have you ever sat down in a Bible study with somebody who is just asking questions? Right, we've, we've talked about the nature of disingenuous questions over the past few weeks. We've all run into it. If you have talked with any unbelieving person who just has questions about the scriptures, you know that not all questions are created alike because not all questioners are alike. Right, to approach the word fruitfully, we have to come with the right motive. We have to come with the right questions. And we have to come with the willingness to agree with what we hear. The scribe models all of those things. Because right? you can come with false motives. You're not going to get anything out of the, the word of the Lord if you come with false motives. You can come with bad questions. Did you know that this book is not designed to field every question that pops into your head? There are a lot of people that come to the scriptures with decent motives, but questions that this book is not interested in answering. And we'll tie ourselves in all kinds of knots trying to make this book answer all of those questions. We won't do so fruitfully if we're not asking good questions of the book. And if we come to this book, if we come to the word of the Lord without a will ahead of time, a willingness to agree with whatever answer the word of the Lord gives us, we might as well not inquire at all. If it is open for debate whether or not we're going to listen to the word of the Lord, whether or not we're going to agree with it, then we should just stay away from it. If we, if we hold the word of the Lord that low in our estimation. So the scribe models all of these good things for us, how to approach the word of the Lord. But, well, I want to finish with a but. Because if you look at Jesus' final estimation of the scribe. It's positive, but consider what Jesus says. We should notice, by the way, Jesus saw that the scribe answered wisely. All right, that speaks very highly of the scribe. And he says to the scribe, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Now, is that a... What if Jesus was saying that about you? If Jesus was saying about you, you are not far from the kingdom of God, how would that sit with you? Would you be comfortable with that? Would you be satisfied with that? I hope you wouldn't be, because not far from is still not in. Right? If I'm not far from home, I've not arrived home yet. I've still got some traveling to do. Our Lord tells the scribe, you are not far from the kingdom of God. We might think, for example, of the, the final lines of that hymn, Almost Persuaded. All right? Almost, well, what does almost get you? Almost is no avail. Almost is but to fail. Sad, sad, that bitter wail, almost but lost. Now, as far as I know, the scriptures don't tell us anything more about this scribe. We don't know the rest of the story for this scribe. We hope for the best. Perhaps, at some point in his life, he made a full conversion. 
But perhaps he just stopped at almost. Perhaps he stopped at not far from and never got to in. In any case, the final passage that we read this morning, verses 35, 36, and 37, probably suggests to us what the scribe was lacking. Or at least they're a useful lesson for us. If someone can be in the position that the scribe is in to answer as wisely as the scribe answers and still just be not far from the kingdom, what might such a person be lacking? Well, here's what happens. Is Jesus taught in the temple. He said, how can the scribes, notice, by the way, he brings up the scribes, how can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself and the Holy Spirit declared, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. So how is he his son? All right now it's notice, by the way, it's Jesus' turn to ask a question. Right? We've been fielding questions from people all month. Now the Lord turns around and asks a question. How is he his son? He keeps it short and simple. What's it mean for the Messiah to be the son of David? What kind of son is called Lord by his father? I guarantee you, not mine. <laughs> I imagine that the rest of you with sons, probably exactly the same way. You never call your son Lord. <laughs> Jesus is asking his audience to think through the implication of that line in Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. The Messiah is to be a descendant of David or a son of David, but David himself calls him my Lord. So here's the thing. It's one thing to agree with Jesus' teaching as the scribe did. Plenty of people in this world like some or even most of the things that Jesus taught. Or you've probably run into this type of person as well, the kind of person who's not hostile to Jesus. In fact, in a lot of ways, they're kind of friendly to what Jesus taught. Right? It's, it's one thing to agree with Jesus just because his words stand up to your own private judgment. A lot of people do that. In my estimation, this thing that Jesus said is good and true. But not many of those people will make the confession that David made, that the son of David is Lord. In other words, his teaching is true, not because it happens to please our judgment, but because of who he is, because he is Lord. And so, if we are to approach the word fruitfully, we must not only come with pure motives, good questions, and a willingness to agree, we must come confessing that Jesus is Lord. That is, that he has authority over us. Only then can we truly hear the word. And so we call on you all this morning to hear the word of the Lord. Don't be just not far from the kingdom. Get in the kingdom. The kingdom is here, and the gates are open for you today. We invite you to come to the Lord with a pure heart, desiring to obey his will. We invite you to turn away from the life of sin, to confess Jesus is Lord, to be baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection, and to live as a new creature, as we've talked about at other times this morning. We are a new creation of God. We just affirmed that as we were taking the Lord's Supper this morning. If you're not part of that yet, we invite you to become part of that. Or if you have obeyed the gospel but have gone astray and are in any need of repentance or in need of the congregation's prayers, whatever your need may be, 
We stand ready to help. If you'll make your need known by coming forward, as together we stand and sing.